Hello, and welcome back to the Two Button Crew podcast. This is episode 38, Kirby's Adventure. I'm your host, Glenn, and I am joined once again by Scott Campbell. Hey, Glenn. How's it going? It's going well. It's uh, it's nice to, to have you back on the podcast. Yeah, and uh, we both played a retro game for, uh, all the way to completion to talk about it today, and it was a good one. I'm excited to discuss it. Okay. And as I stated, that uh, that game is Kirby's Adventure, and I don't believe we've ever done a Kirby game on the podcast before, so as is tradition, let's talk about our history with Kirby. Uh, Scott, would you like to... Uh, would you like to go first? Sure, yeah. And by the way, I do have a product to talk about on today's podcast. It's not a sponsored ad or anything, but I'm excited about it. It's called the Genki Waveform. These are basically AirPods for your Switch. So I'm actually using them to record this podcast, and I'll tell you all about them at the end of the episode. As far as my history with the series, not as in-depth as it probably should be. I think my problem with the Kirby series is that there are just too many games, and I don't feel like they quality control them. So there are some really good ones, and then some that could be probably put in the shovelware category, and I never really know are which ones Are you just talking about like the spinoffs or like the, the mainline games as well? Uh, I, I don't. I probably can't answer that definitively just because of a lack of experience. I mean, I bought Kirby's Epic Yarn and had a decent time with that, although it was weird that there are no lives and, like, no punishment for dying. Mm -hmm. I do love Forgotten Land. I think that that was the first time that Kirby ever really felt and looked truly AAA to me. I feel like Nintendo gave that game its due. Um, I actually got that from my doorstep the morning that my daughter was born so that was like the first game that we played together you know her leg and my arms sleeping and me playing it so and i think it'll be good for co-op when she grows up but anyway i'm a little scattershot with this series and don't always know where to start with it um well there's uh there's actually a flow chart that you can find online that uh, i need a flow chart yeah so uh, I think it was by um, one of the guys from Super Best Friends Play or whatever. Okay. So, but uh, the the typical advice is to start with Kirby Superstar. Um, okay. Which is SNES, right? Yeah, that's a Super Nintendo game, and it's it's really good in co op. So if you have a friend to play with, uh, that's that's how I recommend it. But um, I yeah I my history with Kirby is I think my first Kirby game was Kirby sixty four. Mm. Uh, but I didn't really fall in love with it until I played Kirby Superstar, which was my second Kirby game. And like I said, that game is really great in co-op. It is like um, it's kind of like playing a beat 'em up, actually, because you're just going through smacking bad guys with a with a buddy. Um, and I've been uh, I, I've played most every Kirby game. Um, I think the next one on my li- to do list is Kirby's Dreamland Two. But I'm I'm a pretty big Kirby fan, and Scott, I uh, I don't blame you on the um, questioning the quality of the series. It is a little bit. Here, here's what I say: Kirby, to me, Kirby is like comfort food. It's mm. not something that you play to have your mind blown uh, most of the time. And, and when yeah. it does, you know, it's it, you know, that's that's really good. But it doesn't always blow your mind. Yeah. So. Like for and it's, it's really weird sometimes. Like um, Kirby Triple Deluxe, you know, that was a comfort food game. It would, you know, you just go through it, and then when you reach the end, you get all of like the little collectibles. Uh, and it's like, oh yeah, that was fun. And then the next Kirby game I played was Kirby Plant Robobot, and that one is amazing. You know, that's, so that's probably, probably my second favorite of, in the series. I'd say that's at the top of my list that I want to play next, and I have it. Uh, I have it through maybe not the most traditional means, but I have it, and I would love to play it uh, from everything that I've heard on podcasts and reviews. seems like that's near the pinnacle of the series. Okay, so what I would actually uh, advise you for um, Robobot is there are a few callbacks to Superstar in it. Mm. So I would recommend that you play Superstar for, for the full effect. Okay. Superstar is probably on Switch, right? Yes, it is on the Switch Online. Okay. So which one's your favorite? You said Robobot was your second favorite? Uh, Superstar. Superstar is my favorite. Cool. 
Well, where does Forgotten Land land for you? Third. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, Forgotten Land was one of those ones that uh, I, I'm sad that we never did a podcast on it. But mm-hmm. um, I I did my my usual process for Kirby games is to beat the main story and then try to get all the collectibles. So in Forgotten Land, that would be the Wild D's, and then there's a little something after the uh, after you beat the final boss. And so I did all of that, and I looked at the percentage on it. And you know, I don't usually go for a hundred a hundred percent. It's just like get all the collectibles, and that's good enough. Because normally, it, like some of them, it's like oh, collect all of the keychains or whatever. And it's like I don't care about that. Yeah. Here I saw it's like you have completed ninety four percent of the game or like ninety six percent of the game. It's like, well, shoot! If I'm that close, I might as well. <laughs> so I went through and I did all the arena stuff, and then I I blew all of my uh, savings on a uh, little gotcha figures. Oh yeah. Um, so that was one that I just kind of accidentally. Well, it, it was intentional, I guess, but it, I I did a hundred percent on it just uh, on a on a lark. Which speaks could, to the quality of the game. I couldn't resist either, and it got very hard at the end. Oh, yeah. That's a common Kirby trope, right? It's all cute and cuddly and grassy for the first few worlds, and by the time you get to the end, it's a total, complete disaster nightmare. Like, yeah, some some sort of Lovecraftian stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that is that's very common in Kirby, and uh, I'm I'll I'll have some more stuff to say about that in uh, in when discussing Kirby's adventure. Perfect. Well, yeah, Forgotten Land was my favorite, and it felt to me honestly like Mario Odyssey quality. It felt like they put a ton of polish into that. All the collectibles, the Bottle D missions, yeah. all that was irresistible to me. They both uh, have uh, they both have uh, vocal uh, theme songs, lyric tracks. That's true. Yeah. Yep. And mouthful mode was brilliant. That was inspired. <laughs> yeah, I will say mouthful mode. I thought it was good. How how they implemented it was good. Uh, gosh, this is just turning into the Kirby and the Forgotten Land podcast that I always wanted to do. <laughs> um, it it was good, but um, I one of my issues with those kind of special modes that have become very popular since Kirby's return to dreamland. That's when they first kind of did the, Whoa, this is the big special ability that you use to solve puzzles is that they tend to be, um, I think I've described them in one of my articles as obtrusive pace killers. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, while I don't think it was, I don't think it was terrible in Forgotten Lands. Um, that's why I like Robobots because the the robots very much blend with the rest of Kirby's gameplay. Mm-hmm. But cool, I'm excited to check that out. All right. So anyway, um, we were supposed to be talking about Kirby's Adventure. <laughs> yeah. One more thing about the series is: uh-huh. Have you heard Nintendo Voice Chat uh, Parrish Schneider on there? He says that usually Nintendo sends out a handful of Kirby games towards the end of each system's life cycle. And it like signals the death of the console. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I suppose Kirby's adventure came out, um, in 93. So the super Nintendo had been out for like two or three years by then. And um, that shows, I mean, mm-hmm. the graphics on Kirby's adventure are pretty stellar. Yeah. Um, and Kirby superstar and Kirby dreamland three, I think were like, 95 and 96 so yeah that that's kind of been true since the beginning but uh so let's let's talk about kirby's adventure and as always let's start with the gameplay so you seem to be very very fond of the gameplay scott what what do you think of it just in general i enjoyed it uh i was both pleasantly surprised and a little bit let down i think because like, man, this looks and sounds great. It could practically be an SNES game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think actually it. Sakurai stated that originally they were thinking about doing it for that, but that the um, they didn't have access to dev kits or there was some sort of budget issue that prevented them from doing that. Oh, man. Back in the day before Sakurai was king and they waited on him <laughs> and put whatever he wanted. Was I mean, they put pretty- him in charge of uh, the original Kirby's Dreamland when he was 19. I think he's always... <laughs> Ooh, that, that is impressive. 
Yeah, uh, whenever whenever I think I'm doing well in life, I just remember Sakurai directed his first game when he was 19. What are you doing? <laughs> what what have you done? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, he'll probably also lose the use of his hands long before you will. So there's trade offs. Mm. Um, but the gameplay was decidedly NES. Uh, I felt like the courses might have had more. I don't know, different exits to discover or secrets. And they really tended to be pretty left to right. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can talk about controls too, if you want. Yeah. Uh, Well, so the, the issue I have with the controls, that's really more there for me is that I thought the controls were um, a little unresponsive at times. Huh? Uh, there were a lot of times where I was like pressing the button. It's like, okay, I know I pressed that button. I think there were a few times where I like pressed the button twice and I still got hit when oh, jumping. Interesting. Um, I, I can't and, remember that happening to me, but I know that I was struggling to remember which buttons to press for what, which is funny. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's part of the problem with just the, um, the, like I played it on a, um, a pro controller and that's not really designed for NES games. Yeah, here's what I think it was for me. Mm-hmm. It took me a little bit to realize, but I think I'm actually more used to controlling Kirby and Smash Bros and using the jump button multiple times to float mm. rather than using jump once and then switching to the up arrow. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, that that also is one of those things that I played and it's just like, ah, oh, that's, that's just weird to go back to. Yep, totally. Yeah, I'm glad they, they, they did away with that. <laughs> so you just use Nintendo Switch Online? Mm-hmm. Did you play on original hardware? I played on 3DS. I played the 3D Classics version. Okay. So I'm, I'd be curious for your opinion of how that ran. Because the issue with the uh, version that I played, I don't know if this is an uh, emulation issue, but there is a lot of slowdown in this game. And that's why I was having trouble with the controls, I think, is because for whatever reason, it wasn't registering the input whenever there was a lot of stuff on screen. Oh. I don't think the 3D Classic version slows down. That makes me wonder, is it being emulated or is it like just remade from the ground up? That's That would be an interesting um, thing to look into. But yeah, no, it's uh, there was a lot of slowdown in this game when I, I played it. Yeah. Like, so, um, and this kind of goes in with the, uh, the graphics, but um, pretty much any time there was like, I like if you're using the spark ability or the fire ability, and it... it, it it looks really pretty. They throw a bunch of like basically particle effects on screen on the NES. Yeah. And it's like, wow, this is so cool. It's an NES game with particle effects. And then you re- uh, remember why you didn't do particle effects on the <laughs> NES. <laughs> because it, it just everything slows down to a crawl, you know, whenever there's like more than uh, more than four sprites on screen. Yeah. And totally. so I was, uh, there was constant, constant slowdown in a lot of those areas. And for whatever reason, it seems like some frames just don't register uh, input. <laughs> so I was, I, I was having a, a I, I was kind of frustrated by the end of the game. It's, it's one of those things where you can sort of ignore it in the beginning because it's not that, um, it's not that difficult. But at the end of the game, when they're having you do a little bit more like, precision stuff with some of the the fights it's just like ah uh, gosh i hate this so much yeah well i have now hacked all the consoles where nintendo had online stores that are shut down mm-hmm. so thus the access to the 3d classic version and i definitely recommend it uh yeah it was great everything popped um i missed the 3d effect and i think that It'd be, I kind of wish it would come back. I'm surprised it hasn't shown up in like various smartphones and stuff over the years. It's weird Mm -hmm. that Nintendo still has the corner on this technology somehow. But uh, I think it would be pair really well with the new modern pixel remakes of things like uh, the Final Fantasy games and Octopath Traveler 1 and 2. Those would really pop on a screen like that. Um, Another thing to appreciate here is just the backgrounds. Mm-hmm. That's something that Simeon used to like nail me on with our 8-bit versus 16-bit debates, and he would remind me that NES games have ugly and terrible backgrounds, but that does not apply to Kirby's Adventure. Yeah, no, the, the, that's something I really liked about this game, because one of the things that 
um, I really like about... So, first of all, for an NES game, yes, it has very detailed uh, backgrounds that look really good. But beyond just that, there's a certain style to the really old Kirby games where it's simultaneously like really cute and bubbly and but also a little bit fantastical and the Mm -hmm. thing is a lot of modern kirby games like there was a period in i i kind of call it the flagship period because it was like the the game boy advance and the ds and those kirby games were made by a uh, a subsidiary of capcom called flagship i think it was made by the people who um like Capcom made the Oracle games for Zelda. Right. And then I think they broke that team off into Flagship, and then Flagship, I think, made Minish Cap and the Kirby games. Huh. So um, pretty good team. But the the backgrounds in those games had kind of more this I, I describe it as kind of like mystical sort of thing where you and Kirby Kirby's Air Ride also did that, where it went for a more surrealist angle. Um, and I didn't particularly care for that. And now, like modern Kirby games are kind of a uh, kind of a, a middle ground between the two. But I miss those like very rounded shapes and more simplistic um, graphics for the backgrounds. It's it yeah. just there's there's a flavor to the classic Kirby games that um, is the, the modern games don't quite capture that. And that's true for every series uh, that's been around for like thirty years, but. Yeah, yep, they did a great job, and also the nice chunky HUD. It's definitely takes up some of the most real estate compared to any other NES game. Uh, but you've got your copy ability down there, mm-hmm. little life meter stuff. You've got the life readout for whatever boss you might be fighting. Um, and I never felt annoyed like by that. I didn't think that it took up too much of the screen or anything. So, as a graphic designer, do you approve of the HUD and the, its chunkiness? I approve. Scott approved. Stamp. All right. So, an- another thing about the graphics that I find really interesting is that the the animations are pretty detailed for an NES game. Um, there are there are a lot of like really nice flourishes, not just the um, like the animations for the intro to each area, like you know uh, when you start a, a one of the I guess it's a world whatever you would call it, it uh, plays a nice, cute little animation. But the other thing is, about it is that um, there are little just details, like when Kirby's climbing up a really steep incline, you can like you see him using his hands as well as his feet, which I haven't seen in any other Kirby game. Like when he goes down a steep incline, he's like sliding, which I have seen in other Kirby games. With the, mm. you know, climbing up with his hand on his hands and feet, I haven't seen elsewhere and it's just like dang that is a really nice attention to detail yeah i know i keep comparing this game in my mind to the original super mario bros mm-hmm. like this is the first kirby game compared to the first mario game and it's well, not a no, the first kirby game though. was kirby Dreamland for the game boy this uh, is the second one yeah first kirby game on the nes <laughs> it's not yeah. a fair comparison i mean technically that. the first super mario brothers wasn't mario's first game either so it's it's a fair comparison. It's, it's the one go. where he hits his stride, you could say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yes, this game is 100 times more expressive. Speaking of hitting our, its stride, so the what's notable about this particular game compared to the other Kirby games is this is the uh, the first Kirby game did not have copy abilities. Kirby would just suck stuff up and spit it out. This is the first Kirby game to have copy abilities. Uh, so what do you think of the copy abilities and how do they compare to what you've played in other Kirby games? Not bad. I, it was a little hard to go back to from Forgotten Land being my last one, but nice to see the history. And I think that there were clear favorites and ones that were more like palette swaps because the fire one and the ice one. Mm-hmm. Are, have the same radius and the same type of particle effect with different colors and all that. Uh, but I always liked the more unique ones like laser, hammer, or the parasol. Is that how you say it? Parasol? Yeah, parasol. Yeah. Um, so it was always exciting to try to get a new one. The big bummer is when you swallow something and it says nothing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so... 
I think this was um, – I've done a, an entire article on the nature of the design in Kirby games uh, for the power-ups. And so th- this game has very simple power-ups. You probably wouldn't notice that if you were playing – if Forgotten Land was like your last major Kirby experience. Because those games – that uh, Forgotten Land had fairly simple um, powers as well. They mostly just did like one thing. Maybe there was a, like a variation where you could charge it or something. Here in mm-hmm. um, Kirby's Adventure, it's very much the same thing. You just press the button and Kirby has one ability. Yep. And so you never get too attached to any one ability, which I think is kind of the strength of it because you're you look and say, oh, this ability will be more useful in this context than what I have right now. So you're constantly swapping and there is a lot of variety in that. Um, like I've said, my my preferences and abilities, at least in this game, were largely based off of which one spat a bunch of sprites on screen and which one um, didn't. So I, yep. I particularly liked the laser and sword abilities um, because those ones didn't slow the game down whenever I tried to use them. <laughs> There you go. Another thing I appreciated about the 3D Classic version is it mapped spitting the ability out to the additional face button that you have access to. So I could just press X to get rid of one if I wanted to. And you have to press select on the NES, right? Yeah. Yeah, overall, it's, um, it, you know, it is, uh, it is a little tragic. The hats that Kirby is um, well known for would not make an appearance until, uh, would not come about until Kirby... Uh, uh, superstar so oh, you don't get to see the cute little hats that is didn't even realize that but that is a sad omission yeah they just hadn't thought of it yet and to be fair it would be hard to do with the technology they had available to them yeah i i did find that because of the slowdown there were many many abilities that i just did not care for in this game yeah man that really hampered your experience you no, know, like it's it's one of those things that playing this uh, made me think this is a good game that just the technology was not there to support it, or maybe the emulation on Switch Online stinks, and I'm I'm I don't know I, I haven't heard anything too bad about the NES emulation, but no, me either. It reminds me though of my experience with the original Metroid mm-hmm. between all of the slowdown everywhere and then the lack of a map. That one is hard to go back to. And, I mean, we are playing the 38- to 33-year-old games at this point. So, EGR, as they say, extra grace required. So, what what do you think about the difficulty in the game? Because Kirby games are very, um, very deliberately designed to be fairly easy. Yeah, I was hoping for a steeper ramp. Even the last boss only took me two or three attempts Mm -hmm. so i could have used a little more challenge and i i was a little surprised how many levels that you could just fly over if you wanted to it wasn't until the last couple worlds that they had you navigating through more labyrinth type levels but a lot of them you could just pass over enemies and not even have to engage if you didn't want to yeah and that is that is by design um one of the things i really um, like about Kirby games is that so it, it's interesting because this Kirby game does feel it's it came out in 93 so it's an NES game and you said that it feels very much like an NES game but it definitely has one foot in kind of the Super Nintendo design camp and later because it has a completion compl- uh, percentage on True. the file select uh, which I was a little surprised to see but there are secrets in the levels where you can unlock little things on the, the map screens um, so there is an extra layer of challenge if you want to pursue it to um, to unlock all to unlock all the areas on the map and get 100% completion. So is there something in the game to cue you that you've missed something in this level? Yes, the door will be dark red or dark orange. If there's, I, I did not learn this um, for the longest time when I first played this game years ago, uh, but. Yeah, the uh, the doors are change color when there's nothing in them, and if they stay the same color, then that means that you're missing a secret. Ah, uh, yeah, I, that would have been nice to realize. I think I finished with about seventy three percent, and if I had known what to look for, that might have uh, compelled me to try to complete everything. Well, 
For me, I, I tried doing one of the cannon challenges, but with all the slowdown and the enemies respawning constantly, I was just like, ah, nah, nah, nuts to this. I'm not. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> yeah. And that was the I, one time I used the uh, the rewind function was to try to get that. <laughs> oh, rewind would have been nice. Uh, I struggled with the cannons. I don't know that I ever succeeded. You have to set off the fuse and then make it into the cannon before it blows up, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are tough. Yeah, and you can reset them by leaving the area and coming back, but um, which is interesting because later Kirby games have them just automatically. Um, the fuse will like re, um, re respawn. It'll like just sort of scroll out and trace its path. So I'm really glad that later games are a lot more lenient in that regard. I did not have to leave the area. I basically just scrolled back to the left and the fuse was there again. Really? I could have sworn I had to I had to leave the area to do that. Well, maybe it's another enhancement of the particular version I was playing. Maybe. Or maybe I'm just dumb. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't bet on that. But yeah, so there is there is definitely if you you're someone who wants a bit more of a challenge, there's definitely something for you to dig your teeth into. There's a lot of exploring, and I have to admit, some of those like I kind of remember where they were, but some of those um, hidden switches are like you really have to have just like years of being able of playing video games and being able to go that tile there up against the wall is different than the tile next to it. <laughs> yep. Or let's be real. You needed to have a Nintendo power subscription. Actually, you're right. That's probably how most people got hundred percent completion back in the day. Yeah. And I don't think that it's an accident that some of these secrets are so obtuse. I think that they wanted subscriptions, hmm. but that's a little, little bit on the conspiracy theory side. Well, I mean, that would mean, I don't know if they had anything equivalent in Japan. So they probably would have been designing yeah. these things with consideration to the Japanese market first and foremost. Interesting. So There's I don't know. There's no maybe, magazine out there, huh? Hmm? There was no magazine out there, huh? I don't know if there, if there was an official Nintendo one or not. I know there were a lot of fan magazines, you know. Interesting. Stuff like uh, Famatsu and the like, but... I don't know if Nintendo had an official magazine. Huh. That would be something interesting to look up. Uh, so, going back to presentation, let's uh, let's talk about the music. I would love for you to tell me about the music. Oh, okay. Dude, uh, I forget. You don't listen to video games. I even tried. It just goes in one, out, one ear and out the other, so... Okay, so... <laughs> so sorry. Um... I was surprised because I don't remember liking the soundtrack as much, but I think um, I, I played a version of this that um, I did not originally play the 8-bit version of this years ago, and I don't remember liking the soundtrack too much. But um, I think these tracks work a little bit better as chiptunes. But uh, I was surprised. I, I liked it more than I remember because I remember the soundtrack being just kind of a little bit dull. Um, but you know, here it's like, nah, some of these actually have like some, some nice pep to them and they, they have a, uh, they're, they're energetic or they, they convey a mood. So it's, it's not a bad soundtrack, but having said that, I, I, I went back and I played Kirby's Dreamland immediately after beating Kirby's Adventure just to see if there was so much gosh darn slowdown <laughs> in that yeah. one. And it, no, there's, there, I had slowdown like once or twice and it wasn't that bad. And the thing I realized is that listening to the two soundtracks side by side, it's it's not even close. Like Kirby Dream, Kirby's Dreamland soundtrack is so much better. Um, oh, those uh, those yeah. songs are are very iconic. And Kirby's Adventure, they're just kind of like you know top 80th percentile NES music. Um, it's it's like, but Kirby's Dreamland, it's just like I I hear it like you know I hear. You know, Green Greens, of course, is is iconic. Uh, but man, the Floats Island theme, that's just like sort of the thing where you just, I, I close my eyes and I just lean back in my chair and just let it wash over me. Um, mm. Those songs are so iconic. And like, 
the Game Boy, uh, Game Boy, original Game Boy, I almost said Game Boy Advance, the Game Boy sound chip, I don't like the Game Boy sound chip. I think it's screechy and um, harsh. But my gosh, they made that thing sing. Like the, the quality of those, the, um, the, the sound quality of the Game Boy, uh, the first Kirby game on Game Boy is just uh, astonishing. I'm, I'm really wondering if some, some sort of wizardry went into that, you know. <laughs> It's like how how many uh, how many orphans did you have to sacrifice to get it to sound this good? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, so many orphans that they ran out by the time this game was in development. Yeah, I suppose. So you know, it's and I, I'm making it sound like the you know the NES soundtrack isn't good. Like I said, it's a good song, and some of those songs have like I I do like listening to them. But if if I have a choice, it's nah. I'm, Huh. I'll have to check out the Game Boy game. Yeah, well, you don't have the copy abilities, and the controls are a little bit wonkier. Like, you can't sprint. That's, that's like, the thing that always catches me off guard. Um, wow. You can't splint, sprint, and there's no, um, there's no slide maneuver. So you are much more limited in your options, but... Um, okay. I mean, I spent so much time in the area that I wasn't sprinting many times. Uh, yeah. Is the Game Boy game much shorter than this one? Yeah, you and can beat it in 30 minutes. Take you? Uh, this one took me probably like oh, wow. four hours. But the yeah, the the, yeah. Um, the the Game Boy game is like 30 minutes. And um, the Game Boy game has a... They don't remake the entire game. They, they cut one of the levels. But there is a remake of the Game Boy game in the Super Nintendo uh, Kirby Superstar. Yeah. So... Well, I'm excited. I could see myself becoming a Kirby fan. Um, this is a good, good kind of intro to the older games for me. Mm-hmm. But now that I've talked about the the music, let's talk about the story. Um, now, it's not a complicated story, but there are a few things I just I want to point out uh, for kind of historical purposes. But uh, first, a summary of the story. So. Um, it starts with the, the, in the opening crawl, and it's actually really interesting. Like, it's not, you don't have to read the manual to get the story. You just wait in the title screen, and they'll, they'll play, they'll play a short little demo that tells you the story. Which, again, is like, it's kind of this transitionary game from the NES to the Super Nintendo in some ways. Where they were taking that design philosophy of, you know, put as much of the game in the game as possible. Um... But uh, Kirby, the people of Dreamland stop having dreams one day. Well, I presume this goes on for a while for, before someone decides to do something about it. So Kirby goes to the Fountain of Dreams, to where the dreams come from, to find that King Dedede has broken the Star Rod, which apparently powers the fountain, uh, and given the pieces to all of his underlings. And then, for good measure, decide to go uh, take a bath in the, the fountain. As you do. Yeah, as you do. I mean, he is a penguin. It's hard for him to resist water. Um, <laughs> anyway, so he uh, Kirby then has to go collect the pieces of the Star Rod. Um, and that's the basic setup. And I have to admit, one of the things I like about the early Kirby games is they're not save the world plots. I mean, he is trying to, like, I guess, save Dreamland in a way. But one of the things I like about a lot of Kirby games is that they tend to have pretty minimal stakes, at least yeah. in the older ones. I mean, well, I, I say that, but the first Kirby game is King Dedede steals all the food. That's pretty dire uh, now that I think about it. But um, you, you do need food, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I get cranky without food. Just imagine a bunch of surly Kirbys walking around. I'm right there with you. The hanger is real. Um, but it, it's one of those things where it's not like, oh, you know, the big bad guy's trying to blow up the planet or whatever. I, I like those lower stakes, kind of sillier plots. And so that's something I, I, I really appreciate about this one is it has kind of that storybook kind of vibe to it instead of um, just uh, go go slay Ganon or whatever. Yeah, well, it matches the difficulty, kind of matches the presentation graphics. I do wonder if they were trying to attract a more female audience back in the day. I mean, I thought Kirby was a girl for the longest time. <laughs> yeah. Now, what I find interesting about this Kirby game, and 
spoilers for a game that had that's uh, plot can fit on a uh, napkin and uh, like <laughs> fourteen point font. Yep, double spaced. <laughs> the uh, what we find out at the end, there is a twist at the end, and we find out that um, Diddy broke the star rod because the fountain um, had become infested with nightmares. And so he just figured, okay, it's just better that nobody have bad dreams or have any dreams at all than have bad dreams. So he broke the star rod. And when Kirby puts the star rod, rod back in the fountain, uh, the nightmares escape. And that's the final boss of the game. And it's not an amazing twist, but it does... Um, it does set a precedent that would go on for future Kirby games because it's it's become a, a running gag that uh, Kirby games have to have some sort of dark twist at the end where you find out that um, the villain actually was trying to prevent something worse from happening or the your, your uh, cute little buddy character um, was just waiting to stab you in the back all along. Um, yeah, there you go. And you I, know, guess if, if, I don't know if you were paying attention to the like internet before forgotten lands came out but the little flying squirrel guy i forget his name what what happened was uh people were saying we're like doing little uh comics and stuff of like the character showing up and introducing himself is like hi kirby i'm i'm your uh i'm such and such do you want to be friends and like kirby immediately pulling out a glock and was like stay back <laughs> <laughs> I know how this ends. There's the moral of the story for Kirby's adventure. Don't just treat the symptoms of the problem. Treat the root of the problem. Like Kirby did. I mean, I think that is a good moral. Yeah, we'll go with that. But at the same time, Kirby didn't know there was a problem at the root. <laughs> he he started out just trying to treat the uh, quote-unquote symptom. So uh, I think that maybe it's uh, it'd be more accurate to say that um, when you when you're going to fix a problem, just expect it to spiral out of control and uh, result in you having to kill some eldritch abomination while uh, flying and orbiting the uh, the moon. Yeah, that that's something I will personally apply in my life. Is this Nightmare guy a returning character? Does he? Become no, I don't believe Nightmare has ever returned. I. I never saw the end of the anime. I believe he's the villain of the anime. Okay. But aside from that, no, Nightmare never comes back. That is the uh, that is kind of an interesting thing, despite being quite iconic in the Kirby series as a as a um, as a villain because he was kind of the the first big surprise twist ending villain. Uh, he doesn't yeah. really. Uh, he's he's never really gets mentioned ever again. Okay. And I will say I was a little confused about Meta Knight throughout the game. It's like mm -hmm. sometimes I was fighting him and sometimes he was throwing me uh, invincible superstars for Mario. So Yeah, the the, the invincible uh, lollipops. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That is um interesting. I guess from the very beginning they were trying to do that um that sort of mysterious rival thing. Yeah. He was basically proto man. Yeah, like. he was. They they were kind of doing a Pro Man thing, which is interesting because in the remake that I played, which we'll talk about here in a minute, um, he doesn't actually do the uh, the lollipop thing. He only sticks his troops on you. Oh, interesting. Yeah, huh. but it is again. That's kind of going back to the story. They're like trying to tell a story in this very minimalist format of okay, who is this guy? What of his his motives and. You know, that is one of those things that it, it is really cool that um, when you fight him, it's it's like, okay, you have to have a sword fight with him. Yep. Um, and that's basically held true with almost every Meta Knight fight um, since, is that he, he won't fight you unless um, you pick up the sword. And um, <laughs> I do love me some Meta Knight. Yeah, yeah, and... It's, I, I honestly, I do kind of miss the fact that Meta Knight was, um, they, they've kind of made it like most characters, sort of anti-hero characters that have been around for a really long time. They just sort of make him as kind of this aloof, but unambiguously good character now, where in the past it, it was one of those things where like there is a, um, he does reappear in Superstar and he's, he's pretty scary in Superstar. So 
it's one of those things that I kind of do miss that kind of, um, you know, sort of uncertainty about his character back yeah. in the past. But, you know, that's that's the thing with long running franchises. A lot of the a lot of the uh, the sharp edges tend to get sanded off in the in the stream of time. So as we wrap up the presentation section, do you, do you did you have like a favorite world or level? For me, I I love the black and white throwback. Yes, that that was easily my favorite level. And I remember when I was a kid, I would just run through that um, repeatedly. That's cool. Yeah, and another thing that I thought was really interesting is you don't none of the enemies in that stage give you copy abilities until the very end of it. Oh wow! Um, so if you don't have a copy ability, you have to you have to use the sucking up and spitting out mechanics from the first game. Huh, that's a nice touch. Uh, any other levels that stand out to you? Um, gosh, you know, there's a that that's something that we didn't really get into, but there is a lot of there are a lot of levels that have like really interesting background um, uh, imagery. Like you're sometimes you're on a ship. Other times you're like in a fleet of um, blimps. Um, I guess the blimp stage, I, I just like the the visuals of it. But that is one of those things that I really, um, I think more games should do. And something that I really wish Mario games were better about is that I like stages that feel like you start in one place and you end in another. And you can kind of see the transition between them. Yeah. Um, that, that real sense of place. That, and I'm... I don't mention this a whole lot. I'm working on the game right now. It's don't don't get too excited. It's a long ways mm-hmm. off before it's mm-hmm. it's going to be done. But that's one of the things I want to do is where it's like okay, if you know you start in one place and you like there are certain I, I want it to be where you transition to different areas in the stage that have very distinctive visuals. Where it's like if you're running through a warehouse, you start outside or a factory or whatever. You start outside at the front gate and so you're you're running through the outside and then you go into one of the buildings and there's like conveyor belts and stuff and then maybe you like jump on the roof and drop down into a warehouse where there's a bunch of crates and stuff. So if someone shows you a screenshot from the game, you can go I know where that is. Nice. And Kirby's Adventure because they they the, the they made the game with a lot of variation in like the stage designs and the backgrounds. You you can do that. You you can kind of get you kind of get that sense where you can look at a stage and often there not every stage is is immediately recognizable. It is still an NES game, but there are a lot of stages where it's like, oh yeah, I remember that stage. Yep. I'd say my least favorite was probably World Six with the orange soda kind of just getting in the way of your mobility. Um, so I don't want to end on a downer, but I just remembered that fact (laughs) yeah and that one has one of the worst um hidden switches because you have to bring like a one of the stages you have to bring i think a hammer from outside the stage and then keep it all the way until halfway through yeah um so that one's a bit bit of a slog but yeah so uh Moving on from that, uh, as I've alluded to previously, this game actually has been completely remade from the ground up, not for the 3DS. I mean, maybe it was made remade for the 3DS, I don't know. But um, there is a, much like the original Metroid, there was a Game Boy Advance remake of it that came out in the early 2000s called Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland. And um, this one is, it, it was made by Flagship, like I stated, and... Um, if I had to choose between the two versions, I would definitely suggest the, uh, the Game Boy Advance version for the gameplay because the oh my gosh, the slowdown was so frustrating. You may need to have some counseling sessions to bounce back from this, Glenn. You need to call a Nintendo gameplay counselor. Uh, they shut that down a long time ago. I uh, guess you're out of luck. Yeah, but the 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 gameplay is smoother. Um, there are a few things that they changed, like they no longer have the rotating buildings and butter buildings. They have like this, you just have to kind of stand there and wait for the fog to clear or something. Okay. So there there are a few places where I think the presentation is worse. Also, hmm. like I said, they had like kind of that more um, surrealist backgrounds that just are kind of, well, they fade into the background there. They don't really, you, you don't really notice them unless you're going out of your way to look at them and they just kind of look like a painting. 
Gotcha. Um, so I didn't particularly care for, I, I, I think that for like the standards of the time it was made versus the standards of the time that Kirby's Adventure is made, it's a less impressive game. But I think it's a more competent execution of the actual design of Kirby's Adventure compared to the NES one, just entirely because of the um, the 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 technology was able to keep up with the designer's ambition. Nice. Hmm. I kind of wish that I had played that one now. No, I, I really liked the 3D Classics version, but that's cool. Does this one tend to get ported forward and put on virtual console services and stuff like that? Or do they? does Nintendo focus more of their efforts on this uh, NES original? I think they focus more on the NES original. I don't remember if it was released for the Wii U eShop hmm. um, or virtual console, I, I should say. Uh, if, if I had to, I probably would, uh, if I had the option, I, I'd pick one of the, uh, one of those two up. I don't, I doubt it's very expensive used though. Then again, like, let me just go check eBay real quick. <laughs> so on my Wii U, I have Kirby and the Amazing Mirror, Kirby 64, Canvas Curse, Dream Course, Dreamland 3, Mass Attack, Squeak Squad, Superstar, Nightmare in Dreamland, and uh, Epic Yarn and Return to Dreamland. So the Wii U was a fantastic destination for Kirby fans. Okay, yeah, you can get it with uh, with the manual uh, for twenty one dollars. All right. Um, and then there's another one for forty nine, twenty four dollars for the cartridge by itself, nineteen dollars for the cartridge. Yeah, so it's if if you want to get the original hardware version of it, it's it's not hard to come by. Not bad at all. Yeah, compared to what some games um, from that era go for nowadays, I mean, it's it's crazy. It's it's almost like people are treating that as like their retirement savings or something. It's like, ah, forget gold. Gold is too pedestrian. I, I buy retro games. <laughs> well, you're basically talking about me right now, but yeah. Uh, like Pokemon games on GBA? Oh my goodness. It's not even that they're scarce. There were tons of copies made, but nobody wants to get rid of them. Yeah, I, I can see that. But anyway, so final thoughts. I think it's great for an NES game, and that's all I really had to remind myself of as I was playing through it. Like, yes, I wish it did a little more here and there, uh, but this is it's basically Kirby's introduction to a lot of gamers. I mean, you reminded me that it was, it's not his first game, uh, but in some ways, it effectively is. Yeah, it's it's uh, where it's kind of like the difference between um, Mario Super Mario Brothers and the the original Mario Brothers. Like the original Mario <laughs> Brothers, there you had the Mario, you had Luigi, you had the platforms that you jumped on, you had the turtles, um, and the fireballs and all that. So a lot of the elements were there. But this is you know Super Mario Brothers is where the series really that's that was the what cemented what mario was and this is kind of what um did it for kirby with the copy abilities and such yep. so i think my recommendation would be for people who have access to this game is to check it out play it uh play a few worlds maybe but i wouldn't necessarily feel the need to beat it or complete it uh, i don't think you get a ton out of the later levels that you can't enjoy just in the first hour and uh I would just appreciate it for its technological feats and kind of leave it at that and move on to the next thing would be my thought. Yeah, my thoughts is this is this is a very good game, especially by NES standards. You know, I, I feel like we've been saying that uh, a lot <laughs> this time. And I, I need to make something clear. I actually don't really like NES games that much. It's very hard for me to go back to 8-bit games. Like the yeah. Super Nintendo, maybe it's just because I got my start on the Super Nintendo. But the Super Nintendo is kind of my limit for how retro something can get. Um, NES games, it's just uh, the, the controls always feel a little weird and such. And I don't know. Uh, I think for an NES game, it's it's really good. Um, I think it's one of those things that, assuming the issues I ran into are just part of the original game and not an emulation issue, um, it is one of those things where 
I, I think the I think it's one of those things where the game design is better than the implement, implementation because I've played a version of this game that was much better on the Game Boy Advance. So I think it's one of those things where their ambition kind of outpaced what was possible on the platform that they uh, they developed it for. Um, now, having said that, um, dis- you know, despite the fact that I, ch- I chose this to be our first uh, Kirby game to discuss on the podcast, I, I must confess um, it's nowhere near my favorite in the series. I think it's just kind of mid-tier for Kirby games. Yeah. Well, that's... That's good to hear. I mean, you don't hear a lot of people saying that the original Super Mario Bros. is their favorite Mario game ever. It's good that the series had plenty of room to grow and continued to get better over the over the years. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so l- let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the uh, Genki waveform. So uh, we, we have some time left in the podcast. Perfect. Yep, so I've been using the Genki Waveform headphones for the last couple days and actually recorded this podcast with them. So I'm listening to Glenn in in these earbuds, and I'm using the microphone as well to record this podcast. The microphone so if the is, mic quality is, uh, is terrible, then uh, this podcast is your demonstration. Of- yeah. <laughs> no, I listened back to it before we started and was pretty impressed, actually. Uh, the microphone that I'm using is not in the earbuds. It's in the smart case. So the smart case is kind of a, a new inventive thing that the Genki team created for this product. It allows dual stream, which is not a technology that I've seen in any other wireless headphone. Uh, you can listen to two things at once in these earbuds. So you can plug the case into your switch. It comes with the cables and everything, so you can plug the case into anything that uses USB-A or a headphone jack. Mm -hmm. And then you can listen to that source as well as a Bluetooth source like your phone. So I think what a lot of the people listening to this podcast, a lot of fellow gamers would use this for is playing a video game, listening to a podcast at the same time, or turning off the music in your video game, listening to your own music. So I did this last night with uh, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. I had that in the headphones as well as a podcast. I was listening to the All Things Nintendo podcast and loved it. You can adjust the volume on each of your sources independently, get that balance just right. So it's a really unique feature of those headphones that, like I said, haven't seen anywhere else. They've got all the latest headphone stuff like active noise cancellation. Have you used noise canceling headphones before, Glenn? Uh, yeah, I I have actually. So, or at least I think I have. I bought like a um a really cheap ten dollar pair of headphones from Walmart. Oh, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think they're noise. Ca- I think they're noise canceling. They have a pretty snug fit, but I think they're noise canceling because like. If I brush up against something, it sounds really weird and scratchy. It's, it's probably better to call it noise reduction. Yep. Yeah, and there is passive noise cancellation. What what these headphones have are active noise cancellation, where I love this technology. It's like listening to your ambient noises around you and then transmitting the inverse of that noise into your ear and canceling it out. So effectively making the room go silent. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's really good when you have a young child, right? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Can't even hear her crying anymore. Just kidding. Uh, They're low latency, which you need for gaming. So there's not going to be lag uh, between what's happening on the screen and what you're hearing. They've got a long battery. Like I said, I've been using the microphone and these are not dying compared to a lot of other earbuds that I've used before. Uh, they're super comfortable. They can stay in your ear for a long time. I mean, they come with so many different tips and wings that it'd be hard to find uh, one that doesn't feel good in your ear. And uh, as a first, for me, I've never had this before, they came with memory foam tips as an option. So you can use the regular silicone ones if you prefer those. But I found a set of, I think, the medium size memory foam tips that are super comfortable. Okay, so, and I have a question about that. Yeah. Um, so it's a foam. Foam is very porous. Is it um, is it hard to keep those clean? 
I've only been using these for a few days, so we'll see. I'm sure I will have to like okay. wash them off every once in a while. Well, that's a concern for me because I, I tend to have a lot of earwax. Yeah. So. Well, then, sorry if that was too much information. But. TMI. No, then you'd probably be better served by the silicone tips that are included mm -hmm. too. But I like that they give you the option. And then I got the Kuro color, which is like gray and silver, and it's actually the one that I would have picked if I had. Uh, purchased these but Genki team sent over a set for me to check out and uh, I, I recommend oh, so this. This, this is uh, this is free stuff that they gave you this is free stuff um, awesome I love free stuff I know there's a few colors to choose from when you go to buy it on their website uh, bridges is the default one and I don't like how that one looks as much uh, it's definitely a matter of preference but that's like dark dark navy with gold and hmm. uh, if you're looking to get a pair, I would recommend the Kuro. It looks really nice in person. Does uh, it come in hot pink camo? Hot pink camo? Uh, you might have to special request that one. Get the get the Glenn version. But if you are looking Ask for a new for a pair, friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're looking for a new pair of headphones, uh, these launched on Kickstarter at $250. And even though I really like the Genki Company and have backed a handful of their kickstarters before it was just a little too high for me so i think that they've heard that feedback they are now down to 169 so you can get these oh, for they pulled 170 3ds i know isn't that the exact price cut that 3ds had uh i think it was maybe like 180 or something but yeah it's pretty close yep i don't know if they cut their salary in half like mr iwata did uh, but they brought this down to be quite a bit more reasonable and competitive with other headphones. So if you're buying some earbuds that are wireless and you want the extra features for gamers like dual stream, I would definitely take a look at these. Um, I don't have any complaints, which is strange. Uh, I guess I would say that the smart case is bigger and a little bit bulkier than some other wireless headphones that I've had. So kind of sticks out of your pocket a bit more. Maybe these will kind of live in my backpack instead, but I mean, that's pretty small gripe for the smart case, which is doing a lot. Um, so yeah, any other questions on these, Glenn? No. Um, I've, while we're on the topic of Genki, I just want to mention that they're, uh, I don't know if they still sell it, but their Shadowcast is a really great piece of equipment as well. It's uh, Basically, it lets you uh, turn HDMI input into a, uh, a webcam feed. And so for, uh, I use it for, it. like if you need just a very budget option for um, capturing game footage and you don't want to get like a, I forget the name of the, like the big, name brand for uh, game capture cards, but you don't want to drop like $200 on one of those. Yeah, no, it's, it's Genki makes good stuff. That's if, if you want to know how good it looks, uh, just go watch any review I've done uh, like in the last um, two years or so, because that's why I use the capture footage for those. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. I love the shadow cast. Uh, I also use their covert doc every day. Um, I actually use it mainly to charge my laptop, but it's just this awesome little, basically the size of a wall adapter, like power plug mm -hmm. thing. But you can use that as a full switch dock if you just do HDMI out from that plug into your TV and then USB-C your switch into that. It's a total, complete package. Um, so they sell those for $65. Uh, yeah, maybe you're not looking for new headphones, but I'd still give the Genki website a visit because um, they are big Switch fans and they make some very cool accessories. Mm -hmm. Well, um, having said that, uh, that's all we have to say uh, about Kirby's Adventure and Genki and Kirby in the Forgotten Land and Kirby Superstar <laughs> and uh, Kirby's <laughs> Dreamland. Anyway... You can check us out on social media. Uh, we're on YouTube where we post uh, reviews and uh, this podcast and occasional Super Smash Brothers highlight reels um, whenever Scott's memory card gets full. Exactly. Um, we also are on Facebook and we have a Twitter that you can follow if, if you feel like it. I can't remember the last time I, I posted anything to Twitter, but... 
Um, yeah, so you can follow us there and any of our your favorite podcast services as well. Also, you can if you like tabletop RPGs and you like The Legend of Zelda, you can check out Expedition into the Halno Woods. It is a 48-page uh, adventure module for the 1D4 Chan Legend of Zelda RPG, one of my personal favorite RPGs. Uh, you can download that for free from our website. Just look up uh, Expedition into the Halno Woods. Halno is H A L N O for more information on that. And there's also some nice supplements and battle maps uh, that you can download. There's a little supplement package you can download from there as well. Anyway, that's it for us this time. Thank you uh, once again for listening to the Two Button Crew podcast. Clint, I've got one more little question for you. Oh, okay. It, it is the year of our Lord and Savior, 2023. And here we are making a podcast about a random Kirby game in the middle of your Kirby tier list after one of the best games of all time has been released. So what is going on and what can podcast subscribers expect in the near future? Oh, well, that is an excellent question, Scott. And I, I apologize. Um, I'm, I'm a little cautious about showing people how the sausage is made. But yeah, so <laughs> upcoming, we are hoping to do uh, an episode on another retro game because The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is keeping us very busy. Um, I am maybe 60% of the way through it. I've just from personal experience, I've seen that I tend to clear games faster than the people who have wives and children and jobs. Wait, no, I have a job. What am I saying? Anyway, (laughs) but um, so that one is probably not going to be recorded and it's going to be long. I can guarantee you that. So the editing of it might push it back a few weeks, but that one's probably not going to be recorded until like September or October at the earliest. So we're going to have another retro game coming up. I'm looking at Super Mario 64, which is my favorite game of all time. Whoa. What? Well, that's that, that was just like a bombshell. Wow. Was it? Okay. I don't think I've yeah. been shy about that. <laughs> uh, okay. But I'm, I'm looking forward to... Uh, getting to because you know despite being my favorite game of all time it's been years since i've i've sat down and i've gone through it a hundred percent you're gonna play it with a little stylus wrist strap thing stuck around your thumb uh no i i prefer the the original n64 version all right well i look forward to talking about that all right and so we'll be back uh hopefully sometime later this summer maybe um early autumn uh, with uh, an episode on Super Mario 64. So I've been your host, Glenn, and I've been joined by... Scott, and play some Mario 64, so you'll be uh, up to speed with us when we come back. All right. Thank you for listening. Bye. Bye.